Well, welcome in the name of Jesus to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. Join with me as I share with you how God wants you to be extraordinary. And I'm going to share insight from John G. Lake. That almost seems impossible till we lay hold of what God wants to do with us in the secret place of His presence. And so, Father, we just come in the name of Jesus to receive what you have. We come hungry. We come thirsting after you. Holy Spirit, come and burn in us. Open our eyes to see, ears to hear, and let us hear the word. And let the word produce. Let the word cause a fresh touch in our lives. Father, we thank you that we would glorify Jesus in all that we do, say, and think. And I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, Amen. Now, let me start by sharing with you Jesus. He is the role model. He is the one that we are to look to, Hebrews 12. We are to keep our eyes fixed on Him as the perfect example of the life that God expects us to live and how we are to live it. Now, in John chapter 7, the Pharisees wanted Jesus arrested. So they send these people, these men, to go get Him. Now listen to this in John 7, verses 44 through 45. The men return and they don't have Jesus. Now listen to their excuse. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken like this man speaks. There's something about his words that when you're in his presence, they cause such a holy conviction, a holy fear. They get in you. They do something in you. And if you've been around somebody that's like that, when they speak, those words reverberate on the inside. Those words shake you. Those words, if you're walking in sin, they make you weak. They make you convicted. And they put a holy fear in you. If you're walking right with God, they strengthen you. They cause a fire in your bones. They stir you. That's what Jesus wants. Now look at this in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 32. And he came to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. Now, the Pharisees clearly had authority, and they enforced it. They wanted everybody to know, we have authority. Look at us. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't have to make you aware of His authority. Real authority doesn't have to enforce it. Real authority doesn't have to tell you, you have to respect my authority. But there was power in His words. His words carried such unction. As I said, it did something in you. But they saw even the way He preached. There was such a clarity. There was such a, just a focus and a knowing, and there was such a touch where the Father's hand of authority was on it. I remember being a teacher once, and I, I should I say when I started teaching, many years ago I became a high school teacher, and I started my first day. That first day, that first week, that first month, it was hell, because you would go into class and the students would just completely rebel, and it was so hard to gain control of the class. And I remember one man took me aside and he said, you need to understand authority. You can't enforce it, but you carry it. And if you carry it, you come prepared and they will see it in you. All of a sudden, it changed me. All of a sudden, it made me see things differently. I had authority. My kids love baseball. And if you've ever gone to a game and you see somebody that's hitting four or 500, they come to the plate. Everybody around is terrified because of the authority they carry in that area. You throw that ball, the chances, whether you fire a good pitch or bad pitch, it's going out. There's authority. And we should walk where the enemy looks at you and says, even on his bad days, he's dangerous. And on his good days, watch out. 
That's the place that God wants. But how do we walk in that? John J. Lake said, Christianity has a secret, bless God. The secret of divine power, the secret that makes it different from all known religions. It is the secret of the consciousness that it contains. And the consciousness that Christianity is due to the fact of the spirit of the triumphant Son of God. Because of Jesus, because of what He did, we are to walk. Well, let me step back here and share you something from the Scripture. In Acts 3.25, in, Paul, Peter, I'm sorry, in Peter's first sermon, he preaches about David. And it says, For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence. For he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. He was conscious and he walked in the Old Testament. How much more we who walk in the New Testament under the blood of Jesus, not just with the Spirit of God on us, but listen, they hold of this. It's not just this living relationship this way, which they had in the old, but it is such a vibrant relationship where God now abides in you, changing and transforming you. And the more we yield, the more He walks and lives through us. So that in the spiritual realm, the enemy looks at you and he sees Jesus. We truly become his hands and his feet. Can you imagine as you lay hold of and become conscious more and more of his presence, not just with you, but in you, it will cause a holy fear because you don't want to sin because he's there. And number two, you walk with such a holy boldness and confidence. I know what His will is because as I abide in the Word, I, I know the minute I step into that place where I'm going out of His will because I grieve Him. There's a knowing because of the abiding in the Word. And as I stay in that place in His Word, I know His will, I know His heart, and I know what brings Him glory. There's power, there's boldness. John G. Lake said this, Consequently, when the Spirit of Christ came upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost, it produced in them, by necessity, that which was in the mind of Christ, the same consciousness of power and victory and dominion and Christ-likeness that was common to the nature of Jesus Christ as He sat down in triumph at God's right hand. You have been raised up and seated with Him, and the more we get a revelation of the Spirit of the living God that was in Jesus, now in you, seeking to bring forth through you the demonstration of the victory Jesus won, the bringing the transformation where He takes of the old and kills it and brings forth of the new by His mighty hand. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, As He is so too are you in this world. Not what you will be. And glory to God, when we see Him, we'll be just like Him. But even on this earth, as He is, so too are we in this world. Not by our own doing, but by the Holy Spirit. And I want you to lay hold of this. Because so many people walk in a place where they have a list of all the things they're blowing. And they're trying somehow, in absolute desperation, to overcome, to be this better person. These things that they're trying so hard, how do I overcome these changes and don't do that? And the more I focus on that, the more I do it. The more I give mind share to this, the more I do it. Because the flesh cannot overcome the flesh. God doesn't desire you to walk in the flesh. God wants to bring you to the place where you walk in and by the Spirit. And when you do so, you step into the extraordinary. Because it's not you doing it. It's the Holy Spirit living through you. That's why when we look at Jesus, not alone did Jesus do great things. He did extraordinary things. He did above and beyond things that were greater than the natural level. He had authority over the natural and Jesus declared that because He went to the Father and He sent the Holy Spirit, we would do what? Greater things. Greater things. We would be extraordinary because of the Holy Spirit. John said, in other words, submitting your body, your soul, and your spirit in an act of union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost with the purpose of establishing 
and the individual, the conscious knowledge of the living of the Father, the living of the Son, and the living of the Spirit. To come to such a place where we yield, where we humble ourselves and allow the living God to come abide in us. But God calls us to simply surrender. It's not, see, we've so abided in this wrong place of where we are trying in our flesh not to do these things. And we think if I don't do these things, I honor and please God. But God's calling us to walk over here in the spirit, not focused on those things, but our eyes fixed on him, surrendering and allowing him to change us. And for us more and more every day to become conscious of his in, abiding in us and his presence with us. John went on to say, the life of the person really baptized into the living God, not just baptized into his name, but actually baptized into God, buried in him, inducted into God, inducted into the nature of God the Father, into the nature of God the Son, into the nature of God the Holy Spirit. This is a full, uh, complete surrender, life wholly yielded to, given to, where we come to that place, like Jesus, where we are meant to be emptied of ourselves. Let me continue here. I want you to get this, because John was explaining where most Christianity stays, as I said, in this place. And he says, about 90% of so-called Christianity is all spelled out with four letters, D-O-N-T. Don't do this and don't do that. The individual restraining himself, putting himself in a harness, walking according to laws and ordinances. Don't do this, don't do that. And the more you try, the more your mind is focused on this, the harder it gets. But we're not called to walk in this place, not trying in ourselves, because as we discover in first, or sorry, second Corinthians chapter three, in me I'm inadequate. But over here, the spirit of the living God working in me, transforming me. My eyes not fixed on the list, the don'ts, but fixed on him. That's what Paul is trying to get a hold of, and lit and John. John goes on to say, what a marvelous union was accomplished through the consent of his own will, without which Jesus, Christ himself, could never be in the spotless Lamb of God. By saying yes to God, by yielding his nature with his yes, he permitted the mighty Spirit of God to possess his life and accomplish the will of God in and through him, bless his precious name. That requires a secret place life because if I truly determine in of myself, not based on peer pressure, not based on compliance to the crowd, but because I desire this with everything within me, because it's real, then I have to do it when no one's looking. It has to be in the secret place of my heart where there's a pursuit of going after the living God because God, I want you. And God, I've got to connect with you. And God, I'm seeking you and I surrender to you. This yes comes from the passionate desire of my heart and not just simple words. See, we can go to church and we can say simple words because everybody's saying it and they have no impact. We can get our prayer list and have our formulated prayer and say the right words, but they're only from here. God is looking from the secret place of our heart where the real losses, the real desires, the real things that consume us cry out, God, yes to you. The pursuit of you is in here. In Philippians 2, verses 7 through 8, talking about Jesus, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and be made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Jesus emptied himself in this place where he was not focused on me, my rights, my thoughts, me, but came to such an emptying, 
As long as we are focused on us, as long as our rights, as long as it's all about me, don't walk over me, don't do this to me. But here, Jesus emptied himself. And when he emptied himself, God filled it. The problem is we abide in this place of us, and the enemy fills that. And the enemy takes control of that. And your flesh can't overcome that. And all it does is bring more death, more hurt, more brokenness. But here, as we follow the example of the Messiah and empty, get rid of, yield, trusting that God, though you slay me, I will trust you. I will trust you regardless because I fully sell out. I fully yield. This is the place of life. This is the place of being extraordinary for God. William Seymour, well, let me take a step back. John G. Lake met William Seymour in Chicago in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, William Seymour came to Chicago, I believe, looking for healing. He would go there to Houston and, of course, attend the Bible school and then go to the Azusa, uh, to California, where, of course, he birthed the Azusa Revival. Well, several years later, John G. Lake went down to Azusa and met him again. And he said of William Seymour, listen to this, it was not what he said in his words, but it was what he said from his spirit to my heart that showed me he had more of God in his life than any man I'd ever met up to that time. It was God in him that was attracting the people. Now, I like that. That's what I want people to say of me. It's not you. It's God in you. It's that your words have a depth to them, an unction to them, a life to them. And when they are spoken, they don't draw the attention to you. They lift people to Jesus. They bring people to a greater intimacy with him and his word. It's not me. Salvation is not through me. It's through Jesus. And people are drawn because there's something in you where you need that intimacy with Jesus. And people look and say, I want that. I want that. If we stay in this place of brokenness, what comes out of us is brokenness. And I've been there for so long, and I'm like, God, I don't want that. Where you have verbal diarrhea, you, you get to a place and you don't have life. Instead, you have all this verbal diarrhea of all the hurts and brokenness. I want this life. I want an abundance to come forth from me so that when people hear, they're touched, changed, blessed, encouraged, strengthened. Something extraordinary comes out of our mouths that does something extraordinary in the lives of people. And they recognize it. Maybe they won't say it to you, but they recognize it. Listen to this in Romans 7, verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. That's where I'm talking about, this place. I look and I want to do the right thing. I truly do. I have this list. There's the proof. But the doing of it, I get so far and it's like the the finishing line always moves. I can never get there. And the harder I try, the more I fail. It's like trying for me. Don't eat chocolate. The more I think, don't touch that chocolate, the more I eat it. But when you step over to this place where your eyes are fixed on Jesus and you have a vibrant, living, secret place life with the living God, where He consumes you, where His Word fills you, and your mind is given to Him because what has your mind share and your heart share carries the greatest weight. So in this place, I'm His. In this place, the Spirit of God working in me. And you know what happens? Not alone do I not think about these things. I don't do those things. I'm no longer struggling to stop. I'm simply not doing. I'm killing the old and strengthening the new. And I'm stepping into this place where God says, I can use that. He can't use this. I want to do something extraordinary for God. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, you are provoked as well. Because God is not looking for the great. He's looking for those that will submit.
those that will truly yield in the secret place and allow him to work through them. He's looking for the foolish and the weak to confound the wise and the strong. If you will surrender, he will do extraordinary things through you. Listen to this. That man, maybe the temple of the Holy Spirit, brings a demand on his consciousness that nothing else in the world can be, can bring. If God has ordained that, that my spirit, my soul, and my body, uh, and yours, may become the living, conscious temple of the Spirit, that He, God, by His Spirit, will live in us and manifest through us, what kind of demand does it bring upon us? We need to understand that you were created as a new creation to abide in the secret place because you need it. You are meant to be the temple filled, walking in this vibrant, living, constant relationship. That secret place you discover is really Him. He is the secret place and you'll be found in Him with such a depth, vibrancy of relationship that it is 24-7. And I make a demand on that where I yield, cry out, seek His face and allow Him to work in me and allow Him to work through me because the world doesn't need me. It needs Jesus. And the only way the world's going to see Jesus is when you and I surrender in that secret place and allow God to be God in us and through us. Allow the Lord Jesus to manifest and work through a yielded vessel, through a yielded tongue, through uh, our hearts given holy. Listen to this. John went on to say, why is it that people are slow to yield themselves to the control and government and guidance of the Spirit of God? Why is there not a divine passion in our hearts that such a blessed control should be made possible? Well, in Revelation 2.4, Jesus said, Behold, I have this against you that you've left your first love. This passion, this burning desire that, God, I want to know you. When I wake, I seek you. In the middle of the night, I seek you. Throughout the day, I seek you. See, I remember the old sin life. I remember being caught up in sin. I remember how it possessed me, consumed me. I remember that. But I remember this more. And this grows every day. That secret place, passionate desire. God, I want more of you. There must always be a pressing on, pressing forward, and a yielding. And as we do, God will do extraordinary. Now, I don't know where you're at. Ministry, finance, or business, home life. God wants to do through you something that is extraordinary, not by your doing, but by His hands. Oh, if we could get a hold of what God can do through a yielded vessel. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, of men and women that have gone before, ordinary people, those that surrendered and by faith dared believe God that God did extraordinary things through. They didn't start in this great place. And from where they started, you would never imagine where they were going. God took them something greater. And God wants to do something beyond anything you can imagine or think. If we will simply have this vibrant relationship with Him in the secret place and allow Him to do the extraordinary. Get our eyes off of us, off of our limitation. John said, born of God, the nature of man brought in union with God by the Holy Ghost. Blessed be his holy name. In the secret place, I become one with him by choice. One by him by the yielding. One by him by the pursuit. One by him because he is my everything. He is my one passionate desire. In Romans 8, 11, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit working in you will change, transform this vessel, its limitations and its weaknesses. God worked through the vessel of Jesus, an earthen vessel, and did above and beyond what that earthly vessel could do because God is not limited. And if we will get to that place and get our control off, and allow God to simply be God in our lives, to work and to do. Oh, He wants to do the extraordinary and glorify His name in and through you. 
Let me finish with this. Lake said, open your soul to him and let the blessed living spirit of God have entrance into your nature. Say yes to God. Say yes to God. Oh, I pray that in the name of Jesus, this message has so ministered to you and, and hit you right where you're at. That today will be the day you say yes. Today will be the day where you stop walking in the old and choose to walk in the new, in the secret place of his presence. This is the day of the new beginning. This is the day where the new things shall spring forth. And this is the day where there's a fresh touch from heaven to lift, to heal, to bind up, and to bring forth. This is the day. I just pray that in the name of Jesus that you're truly blessed and receive all that he has. If this message has blessed you, would you please like, share, and subscribe? Would you consider becoming a prayer partner with us? Help us. Stand with us. Because it's through prayer partners that we're able to get a hold of the right word in season and see the impact. It costs you nothing, as I like to say. We don't ask I trust that God will put in the hearts of people to be financial partners, because yes, it takes finances. But I believe that I want the ministry to be a testimony of God's provision. And so I thank all those that God has so touched and moved to be financial partners. And I'm most so grateful for those who just want to be prayer partners. Maybe you want to be both. That's okay. Maybe just you can't afford it. That's okay. But there's power when we stand together in prayer to see the backsliders brought back in this late hour. And we're seeing thousands come back. And for that, I am so appreciative. Now, if you join, you can check out more information. Uh, go to our website, godsgeneralsandrevivals.com and go to the partner page. You get invited to our Zoom meetings uh, and you get our email newsletter twice a week. And you get really, you know, through those Zoom meetings, an opportunity uh, where I can get to minister to so many people. Well, I pray that you're blessed. I pray that you're encouraged. I thank you. And I also want to remind you and speak to you, uh, we are planning a, a partners meeting here uh, in the Chicago and Elgin area in end of June, around June 25th and 26th. Uh, all right now, we're working out the plans, more details shortly. So check out uh, that if you're in this area, I want to come in and visit. It's going to be a powerful time. Amen. Well, thank you. Be blessed. Be encouraged in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.